Good morning. Um, I'd like to do two things today. First, I'd like to briefly describe to you what threat assessment is and how it can be used to prevent mass shootings. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of challenges with threat assessment and some proposed solutions. So first, what is threat assessment? It's probably best to think of it this way. It's a systematic strategy that can be used to identify, assess, and manage potential mass shooters. There's a lot of research about different types of mass shooters, school shooters, active shooters, mass murderers, adolescent mass murderers, and they all show essentially the same thing. It's not often that these offenders just snap. These aren't impulsive acts. They don't just happen. Rather, they're the result of planning and preparation over a time period in which the person moves towards what has been termed a pathway to violence. And it's during this movement, planning and preparation along this pathway, that mass shooters display warning signs. They almost always do. Sometimes they're called concerning behaviors, red flag behaviors, but they're warning signs. For example, we heard a little bit already about a thing called behavioral leakage. That's when a person intentionally or unintentionally reveals that they're at least contemplating a violent attack. And again, studies in multiple types of offenders, school shooters, active shooters, mass murderers, show that between 50 and 80% of these people display behavioral leakage. There are lots of other types of warning signs, but that's a very common one. Threat assessment is built, predicated, on the existence of these warning signs. That is how a potential mass shooter is identified. The next step, once a person's been identified, is for a threat assessment team to assess them and manage the situation. Ideally, this will be done by a trained multidisciplinary team. And by multidisciplinary, I mean people who have expertise in different aspects of human behavior. So a threat assessment team might contain a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, uh, somebody from human resources if it's done at work, um, a school counselor if it's a school-based team, and of course, law enforcement. But there's a critical point here. These are not primarily law enforcement teams. They're teams with law enforcement on them. And that makes a difference in how they act. Once a person's been identified as a person of concern, the threat assessment team will assess the situation. They'll gather as much information as they can from as many sources as they can, as quickly as they can. It's a dynamic and ongoing process, but they want to know who is this person of concern? What's their behavioral history, their criminal history, any mental health history, their relationships? Just where are they and where are they in relation to their intended target? Using that information, the threat assessment team will then try and figure out a plan to manage the person off the pathway to violence. Frequently, a person of concern hasn't done anything for which they could even be arrested for at this point. So arrests is not really the primary outcome of threat assessment management. Here's an example. Virginia is the only state that requires its public schools to have threat assessment teams. So a 2018 study of 1,800 threat assessment cases handled in one year in Virginia showed this. 1,800 cases, 30% of which were deemed to be serious threats. After the threat assessment process, only 5% resulted in any type of law enforcement involvement at all. So no formal criminal justice involvement for 95% of the cases. And importantly, this approach works better than schools that don't have threat assessment teams. Most of the students were handled through a variety of strategies, in-school suspensions, transfer to another school, provision of special education, mental health counseling, family counseling, whatever it is. But arrest and prosecution is not the default. And that's important to remember. Threat assessment is considered to be a best practice. It's considered to be a best practice by the United States Secret Service, which actually developed the approach, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Education, the American Psychological Association. The FBI calls threat assessment by far the best strategy to prevent public violence. So if it's a best practice, what could be the problems? Here's the first challenge. It is not widely enough used. A separate study of uh, 3,500 schools in the United States found that only 42% have threat assessment teams. And importantly, of those threat assessment teams, only half meet regularly. Here's another example why we know there's not enough. A couple of weeks ago, the governor of Texas signed a series of executive orders designed to combat public shootings. One of those executive orders establishes regional, multidisciplinary threat assessment teams for Texas, which is great. But that will make Texas one of a handful of states that has this. Most states do not have a statewide threat assessment strategy. So what can we do about this, right? We have a best practice. It's not widely enough used. One very practical thing would be to pass the Threat Assessment Prevention and Safety Act of 2019, 
currently pending in Congress. It's called the TAPS Act, Threat Assessment Prevention and Safety Act. It would do a number of things, right? One of which is it will establish guidelines and practices that can be used to train state and local threat assessment teams. Right? So standardized practices. It will also establish grants to states and communities that want to create their own threat assessment teams, which is great. I definitely think that should be done. I think we can do more, though. Public safety is not the only place where best practices don't translate exactly into common practices. It happens all the time. It happens in public health, all areas of knowledge. There's a thing called dissemination and implementation science that addresses this exact issue. Dissemination and implementation science is, you know, as the name would suggest, focused specifically on taking evidence-based research, best practices, and figuring out how to translate that into actual real-world practices. So dissemination and implementation science has developed frameworks that can be used to guide a process to get research and best practices into real practices. So the hope is eventually things go from best to common to universal. And I would think in addition to the TAPS Act, which again I think is a fantastic idea, we might use grants to establish dissemination and implementation centers at the state level who could then identify specific challenges and obstacles in whatever state it is and work to a situation where we have a more organic spread of threat assessment because it's a best practice uh, and not necessarily relating, related to getting funding because the TAPS Act funding, while terrific, is still somewhat limited. You're not going to be able to fund every threat assessment team that's needed. The second challenge, as you've heard from me and from other people, mass shooters display warning signs as they progress down their pathway to violence. The important thing to remember about that, though, is that people have to notice that. Somebody has to see the concerning behavior or the warning sign before it becomes useful. The people who do that we call bystanders. Bystanders are considered by the FBI and others to be sort of force multipliers, right? They're the eyes and ears of threat assessment teams. They're extremely important. There's a problem, though. They don't always report what they see and what they're concerned about. In 2018, I co-authored a study with the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit where we looked at 63 active shooters. So we had the full law enforcement records for all 63 of these shooters. We did as deep a dive into them as we possibly could. What we found is, on average, they each displayed between four and five concerning behaviors, right? things that were actually noticed at the time by bystanders. Right? So four or five concerning behaviors before the attack. That's great. The warning signs are there. People do see them. But what we found is that the overwhelmingly most common response by a bystander was to go talk to the person who was displaying the concerning behavior. It was not to report it to any authority at all, not to a school official, not to a human resource person at work, not to law enforcement. It makes sense in a way. What we also found was the people most likely to notice are, and, and this just makes common sense, neighbors, acquaintances, coworkers, family, friends and maybe be reluctant and unsure about what to do. I think there is something we can do, and I think what we could use is principles from a concept called social norms marketing. All right, so what are social norms? Social norms are our shared understandings of what people do in a certain situation and what others think is the right thing to do. Researchers have come up with a key insight in this area, which is this. People sometimes misperceive what the social norms are. So social norms really powerfully influence our behavior. Sometimes people get it wrong, though. People are starting to use social norms marketing for all kinds of things, but it's be beginning to be used in violence prevention efforts. There's been studies about combating sexual violence, studies about combating, bu combating bullying at school using social norms marketing. The idea is if you give people the correct information about what people really think is the right thing to do, that's the marketing part, you can actually change their behavior. So I think as much as we can change be reporting behavior about bullying, about uh, uh, antisocial behavior such as sexual violence, we could use that to do studies about using social norms marketing to increase people's willingness to report concerning behaviors. And I think in particular, we should also be marketing the idea, as I discussed in the beginning, that if you report somebody and it's managed by a threat assessment team, it is not necessarily going to wind up in an arrest. Most times, Reports to threat assessment teams are actually screened out. They're determined not to be serious threats. 
So I think if we looked at social norms marketing, I think we could improve people's willingness to report, generally speaking, in the community. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions at the appropriate time.